Hello, good evening. My name is Blaze Pengley. I'm from Crypto Tax Calculator. I'm joined by my colleague Patrick McGimsey, also from Crypto Tax Calculator. And today we are taking you on a deep dive into DeFi taxes. So grab your mask, grab your snorkel, and let's get into it. We are super fortunate to be joined by Noah and Wesley from the network firm. Noah, Wesley, how are you both? Doing well, thank you. Doing well. Yeah, glad to be with you. So glad to have you here. And now crypto is confusing, crypto taxes even more confusing, and especially when it comes to decentralized finance, it, well, you know, it's it's a confusing world out there. So we're really excited for you guys to bring some clarity. Um, I'm curious, Noah, Wesley, what's your experience? Tell us about, you know, you're the experts here. Tell us about your experience and what you guys do at the network then. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So uh, we're a, a group of uh, 17 total at the firm. So we're a small firm, we're a relatively new firm, but we're uh, born out of, uh, like we used to say, the most innovative uh, accounting firm in the US, which is a, a top 20 firm uh, that most of us worked at for many years, most of the team. Uh, and there we built a very successful industry group, um, about 75 professionals. We're a very fast growing group. One of our main service lines there was uh, tax and both individual and high net worth tax, corporate tax, international tax matters. And we supported uh, those tax CPAs in all sort of the crypto nuances, you know, all the way from just basic understanding, what is this client doing? How can I understand it as a tax CPA? all the way through to actually hand-holding and doing basis tracking, maintaining uh, trade ledgers and basis tracking and reporting for clients year over year, so. Amazing. Um, so you're definitely the experts here. So we're very excited to pick your brains. Um, a little bit about Crypto Tax Calculator. So Crypto Tax Calculator is an Australian born and made uh, tax software that you can access anywhere in the world and use to help with your crypto taxes. It's the only crypto tax software built for Web3 and we have a real focus on decentralized finance, which is why we're hosting the session today. Um, before we get into it, I will remind everyone that this is not specific tax advice personal to your own situation. So if you are looking for really personal specific tax advice, um, please go seek uh, the help of a professional. Today is just more about education and information. Um, Patrick, I'll throw to you and I'm ready. Are you guys ready? Noah, Wesley, can we pick your brains? Let's go. That's why we're here. Right. Sounds good. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Blaze. Um, so today uh, we're going to go down the DeFi rabbit hole a bit and uh, explore some of the more frequently asked questions about DeFi taxes um, to warm up and then sort of move into some more curly questions um, that I know you guys will love to answer. Um, before we dive into the questions, no. Would you mind giving us a basic overview of how crypto is treated by the IRS? Yeah, for sure. From a U.S. tax perspective, thinking about the Internal Revenue Service, um, not all things are perfectly clear, uh, but there have been a number of pronouncements or guidance from IRS over the years. And essentially what we learn is that crypto or digital assets are considered property um, in IRS's uh, lens. Uh, so there's, you know, traditional analogies there. I think, you know, IRS also treats securities or equities uh, effectively as property. And so there's kind of, you know, some analogies that uh, can be gathered there. Um, it's definitely important to, to note here, too, that um, while property, you know, there's significant differences between the filing uh, or the compliance obligations of an individual versus that of a corporate um, or you know certain elections that could even be made for individuals that are running a trade or business. Um, there are a few things that are clear. I mean, maybe we could go through those. You know, I think um, you know there's while there's tons of gray area, I think there are some things that are pretty settled at this point. Even though they might not, they might be settled by pretty specific pronouncement or guidance, or they might be pretty much settled by you know common practice. Of practitioners in the space and some consensus, I think you could say, among uh, CPA practitioners. So, um, you know, token for token trades, uh, you know, pretty clearly property for property swaps or disposition of one asset for another uh, is capital gains land, right? So, again, there's a traditional analogy to securities. You can think of trading uh, Apple stock for Tesla stock or 
uh, you know, Bitcoin for ETH, right? These are dispositions and have a capital gain recognition event. Um, receipt of block rewards is is one that is a bit open actually in the case law, but also, you know, there, there's some guidance on it. Um, and so when I say staking, I really, re I'm referring to proof of stake blockchains, you know, a delegated stake service, or maybe a centralized provider, like a, you know, a staking service through a platform. Um, but pretty clearly there, we're in income land, ordinary income uh, at fair market value at the time of receipt. Um, we also know that, uh, you know, that receipts, I guess you could say receipt of value from tokens deposited. Um, some people use the term staking when they're talking about DeFi, right? Uh, an LP position or a, a deposit position as I have staked value in the protocol. Um, that also, you know, we're in income land. We're talking about receipt of interest, right? Or accrued fees, accrued trading fees or accrued interest paid by borrowers in the protocol. Um, and again, we're talking about, uh, you know, income land there, fair market value at the time of receipt again. And we'll probably get to it later, but there are, uh, you know, potentially significant differences between a central, you know, use of a centralized lending protocol or platform, excuse me, like a, you know, a crypto lending platform versus doing that equivalent activity sort of on in an on-chain way or through an on-chain protocol. Forks, um, kind of old news at this point, um, I think in the space, but that is a pretty clear uh, tax pronouncement, you know, uh, again, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash being the sort of precipitating event for IRS's guidance there, but essentially that a fork, you know, you're holding one uh, one token on chain A and you have a fork to chain B, that the chain B token is uh, is income fair market value at the time of receipt. And still in income land, we have airdrops, right? Uh, all the lovely airdrops that everyone gets. And of course we want all of them, right? Uh, no, we don't, you know, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> so. Um, there are, of course, those that, you know, people engage with the protocol. They are very interested in contributing maybe in a DAO context or um, or interested in the success of that protocol. And certainly they get airdrops and, and like that. And then there's all the other sort of spam stuff and things in between. Um, it's pretty clear. I think this one by consensus that airdrops will be, you know, income again at fair market value at the time receipt. That one causes a big problem for taxpayers, especially when you've got bad sort of market pricing data, but um, got a couple more that are, I think, clear, you know, wash sale rules, um, uh, really not applicable to, to crypto as far as we know at this time. Uh, I will caveat that. It's a big caveat. Um, the wash sale rules really just aren't uh, specific, right? They enumerate securities, but not sort of other property. And so, it could be it very well could be and might be that IRS says, yeah, wash sale rules should apply to crypto and in a crypto trade context. Um, and that could and that's probably likely to happen through legislation very soon or IRS guidance very soon. Um, and that could also be retroactive, too. I think that people should think about that. It wouldn't be the first time the IRS has made a retroactive rule change so or pronouncement. Um, there's a kind of a complicated group of SAFs, you know, comp compensation for services, I think. Just keeping it, removing SAFs for a second or simple agreement for future tokens, um, just compensation for services, that's taxable income. IRS doesn't uh, care that it's crypto versus dollars or USDC versus dollars, right? It's it's income at the time of receipt. Um, and the last thing that I think we know that's pretty clear is IRS is focused on enforcement um, and, you know, pretty clearly adding resources uh, to be able to effectively enforce. Right. Well, that gives us pretty good context moving forward. Um, and that's Can I just end up in to say that if that sounded like gobbledygook to you and you still have questions, please pop your questions in the chat or in the comments on YouTube and we'll get to them at the end so we'll have a chance to answer. Awesome. Yeah, keep that. Add all the curly questions down there as well so we can uh, keep <laughs> Noah and Wesley on their toes. Um Wesley, I'm going to throw this one to you. It's a bit of a warm-up question. It's something that basically everyone does when they get started with, you know, on-chain trading and figuring out non-custodial wallets and that sort of thing. Um, crypto to crypto trades, are they taxable? And uh, what do people need to consider about those? Sure. So I think pretty much, I think Noah covered that for the most part. So, I mean, we could think of any type of crypto trading just in the most simple form. 
the simple swapping method. So let's say in a DeFi example, I own Bitcoin. I want to go to Uniswap's protocol and I want to swap that for Ethereum at a specific, specific date and time. Um, one thing that I would consider is the cost basis of what I acquired that Ethereum for. So if I acquire this Ethereum um, in fiat for $1,000, let's say the market price of that specific date and time, um, that moment, that time and date that I am swapping that Ethereum for Bitcoin is a taxable event. So the market price that I'm acquiring that Bitcoin for um, less the cost basis of what I originally acquired that Ethereum for would be your capital gain or capital loss at that specific date and time. So you could think of a financial year being, uh, you know, let's use 2022 coming to a close in the next week here, unless you're extending. Um, you look at all of those executed or realized gains and losses through the year, and then you're taking that total and you're divvying it up between uh, short-term gains and long-term gains. So taking it a step further, if you're holding that Ethereum that you swap for Bitcoin on that protocol, if you held that more than a year, um, then it would be a long-term gain. If you held that less than a year, then it would be a short-term gain. So just, I think that's important to bring up on this call too, is um, there's different thresholds for capital gains for short term and long term. So just generally speaking, be conscious of that um, as you know, in the, from a US perspective, um, the guidance currently is any type of swapping um, in that way is a capital gains event. Cool, that makes sense. So, but so like, what about trading from one asset, um, like it, like Ethereum, for example, and then trading to, you know, like a pegged version of that asset or, or even wrapping that asset is something like that taxable? Yeah, that um, absolutely. I think is a not clear question, not not clear answer in terms of IRS guidance. So I think this is an area where, again, not specific tax advice. You you really should consider your own circumstances. But I think a general framework, um, you know, the way to think about this is is the economic substance of the transaction, right? So the terminology is important. The terminology should reflect the actual substance of the transaction at issue. And then the economic substance really determines the tax treatment. Um, so, you know, I think that in this bucket, I think there are tokens that are arguably sort of trackers, right? You've got tokens that are uh, swapped, you know, uh, or excuse me, or wrapped, and you've got sort of bridge capabilities, right? So they are kind of similar in some contexts, but I think very different in others. And so like, that sounds a little confusing. So to break it down, let's just keep it between wrapping and bridging, right? So in Wes's example, you know, he want, he had Bitcoin, he wanted to go to Uniswap to get ETH. Well, how does he do that? Bitcoin doesn't run on the Ethereum blockchain, right? It runs on the Bitcoin blockchain. So he has to wrap ETH, right? Uh, how does he wrap ETH? He does that through a protocol. Now, if Wes's intent is, is to use wrapped ETH as a new asset, as a new form of property in order to go and obtain another property, Bitcoin, or excuse me, uh, uh, ETH, right? Uh, wrapped Bitcoin for ETH on another marketplace. Then that wrapping event, you know, is in IRS's viewpoint, most likely a disposition of one asset for another. Um, you know, Wes in that context might say, look, that wasn't my intent. I had old ETH, right? I had ETH that I bought, um, or I had Bitcoin that I bought, you know, way back in the day, let's say, you know, I was early in Bitcoin, I have a very low cost basis. When I go and wrap that Bitcoin, I'm not trying to destroy that cost basis. I'm just trying to make it portable, right? Um, so, you know, I think it, it kind of depends, you know, I think that, you know, if you're working with a CPA practitioner, you can probably take some more of these novel approaches. I think the baseline is to think about wrapping as really is probably most fairly one disp disposition of one asset for another. Um, you know, I think crypto tax calculator facilitates this pretty well, right? You have some global settings that you can kind of choose that tax ma tax methodology um, and, and, you know, get the downstream effect uh, however you choose. Bridging, maybe we set that aside for a second, happy to talk about it, but I think the argument there is even better maybe, you know, for a taxpayer, right? In terms of that intent, uh, you know, what is the intent? Like, I'm not trying to destroy cost basis. 
right? I'm not trying to get a bridge token so that I can sell it. I'm getting a bridge token so that I can make it maybe more leverageable or marketable or depositable, right, on another blockchain. And and so there's a maybe a good argument there to sort of be able to carry cost basis, right? I'm I'm taking my securities from Schwab and moving them over to um, E Trade or whatever, or a different custodian, right? I'm porting the asset. I'm not really disposing of it. Would be the kind of the argument by analogy there. So, yeah. I think at a high level, it really depends on the use case and really the purpose of that activity. I mean, a lot of the clients that we work with, it also to you know determine on that risk tolerance and you know determining that IRS guidance or what we could see being released over the next couple of years too. So, I mean, there's there's some examples where they might want to take a non-taxable approach on some of that wrapping activity because of the purpose or the nature of that activity afterwards. So, for example, if you have ETH and you're wrapping it, um, but the purpose of that is to deposit into a liquidity pool, for example, well, maybe in, in that it's you're not really doing it to trade. You're doing it to, you know, get staking rewards or some yield on that activity, maybe that's more defendable as being non-taxable type of activity, right? But maybe like the what Noah mentioned, if the purpose is more trading, you're trading a lot of these assets uh, more often, then I think it's, it's harder to defend a position of being non-taxable because ultimately that purpose of buying and selling that asset was to be trading for gains and losses. Okay, that makes sense. And, and with this slide, like with intent, um, is this something that people should be like recording with each transaction? So in case they were audited, they have records of, you know, what the intent was for that particular transaction. Yeah. I think that's a really good question um, because I was kind of going to bring up the point that, you know, this we, we keep talking about or we, I keep using the refrain, you know, could take the position, right? The taxpayer could take the position or could make the argument. Um, and that really only comes up in sort of a controversy case, as IRS calls it, right, where they've potentially audited and then have some disagreement on a tax treatment or recognition events or whatever with the taxpayer. And then it goes into what we call controversy, which in sometimes is, is not very contentious, is actually pretty easy to clarify things. And then there's other cases where it's much potentially more contentious and, and things like that and litigation. Right. But in any case, um, there's two things you can do. Number one, good record keeping. Um, yeah, as an accounting firm, as accounting nerds, we're all about good records. We're all about process, policy controls. Um, we don't expect you to be that, but a trade journal would be nice, you know, and um, certainly using a tool, right? Using crypto tax calculator is one really great step in record keeping. Of course, you've got a very good source of truth for what happened. You've also got a source of truth for any adjustments that you made to that ledger in a manual way or cost basis that was transferred or marked up or marked down, right? Things like that. Um, but in addition to that, yeah, a simple Excel sheet that is a daily trade journal or maybe not daily, but a trade journal um, where you can mark out, yeah, here's the date, here's sort of the intent of the trade. Here's what I'm trying to do. Um, you know, I think that that is good documentation for you. It won't always, I mean, candidly, in a controversy case, that might not be enough, right? It might be IRS says, well, that's a very nice intent that you have, right? But the law is this, and the traditional analogy to existing guidance is this, and it's clear, right, that you have a tax obligation on that um, when you've recorded that you didn't, right? So, um, but yeah, they're not casual issues. So I do, I do make that clear. I want to make that clear to people, right? That like, as you think about taking an aggressive approach or one that differs from what is pretty clear under IRS guidance or accepted practice, um, but yeah, you want to want to be very cautious about that. And and you know, one way to do that is good record keeping. The other way is, frankly, go to a tax attorney or a CPA firm and look for, you know, an actual legal opinion or a tax uh, tax opinion letter is what they're called. But this is where you know a professional documents. Hey, here's here's what we think about this proposed tax treatment and what authorities there are to support it or not support it. Yeah, and I also want to add context to that. So another way that you can help yourself and using crypto tax calculators tool is using that notes feature on some of these transactions. So if you're reviewing some of the transactions yourself and maybe you have questions about the specific hash 
Uh, you have the ability to add a comment on there. Maybe you come back later or maybe you have a handful of questions once you're reconciling yourself and you need to talk to a tax CPA. Well, um, ultimately, they'll look at that information for you and then they can help you um, and give you guidance on that specific treatment. So a lot of times, you know, a crypto tax calculator does a fantastic job reconciling some of these types of activity. But there are nuances that we're talking about today that it is helpful to um, get advice from a tax CPA on that specific treatment. Yeah, for sure. I was actually going to mention that I, I've started using the comments um, function on like kind of bigger transactions that I know are maybe potentially falling into a gray area and are going to impact my taxes more significantly. So um, that's that's a pretty good point that you touched on there, Wesley. Um, if we move on, like I know, Wesley, you kind of touched on this before, but with, you know, providing liquidity to liquidity pools, is that sort of seen as the same as what we were just talking about with crypto to crypto trades or is there anything to consider there with kind of multiple tokens being involved yeah that's that's a great question and i feel like that's also one of those important nuances because you know again to highlight irs has not really released anything that provides good guidance on this activity so generally speaking we break it down into a couple of different ways um i think um, in terms of liquidity depositing. So if we're thinking about it from a simplistic level, um, you're taking one of these assets, you're depositing it into a pool um, where you're then receiving an, L an LP token or what I like to think of as like an IOU for that principle that you're adding to that pool. So, you know, the purpose in that case would be to um, ultimately redeem that LP token somewhere at a later date where then you're pulling out that original principal and maybe some potential interest. Um, that's one very generic use case, right? I think going into the nuances, there's also liquidity pools where you're earning or you're able to redeem some of those rewards, right? While you're, um, while you're a part of that pool. Um, whether it's redeemable on a daily basis, uh, it could be even on an incremental basis through the day. Um, there's a handful of ways that it can ultimately hit your wallet. And I think it's important to understand, I, I guess the specific, uh, de the specific DeFi tool that you're using and how you're transacting with, with that activity. So um, I know on Uniswap as well, we, we talked about that earlier and mentioning your point of multiple assets, right? I know on Uniswaps, I think V3, where you have the ability to park multiple assets and then you can withdraw a portion of one of those assets, uh, a portion of one of those LP tokens and redeem it for the other. So ultimately these, these right now are difficult, both from a software perspective to capture that type of activity and also from an accounting perspective to be able to break apart that principal versus interest. So the way that we, uh, you know, look at this activity um, from a high level is determining if we can separate that principal, that original liquidity that you deposited into this pool versus um, maybe the interest earned or that specific uh, interest or rewards that you're earning um, from the pool. So you know, from a tax perspective, going back to uh, Noah's point between capital gains and income, um, you could think of any market price change as a, you know, a capital gain or loss event. So anytime you're, um, for example, withdrawing from that liquidity pool, um, there's going to be a different market price than what you originally um, added to that liquidity pool. So the difference in that market price would be that capital gain or capital loss event, right? And I think most simply speaking on the rewards perspective, so any type of interest rewards that you're earning through the year, you could think of it in the other bucket as actual income that you're earning off of that asset that's um, providing your rewards. And so like, uh, take, sorry, no, you, you go ahead. Oh, I was going to build on that real quick, if you don't mind. Yeah. So yeah, we'll and then maybe see. can I go back to one of the questions I see from uh, Muzi Sashi, which I think would be kind of good to jump back to. Um, 
So yeah, I think of it like there's three general categories, right? There's lots of different DeFi protocols, different tokenomics, you know, some are lending protocols, some are, you know, swap, uh, you know, marketplaces. Um, but in any case, you really kind of have three main steps when you're talking about the LP uh, aspect of it or the liquidity provision aspect, which is providing that liquidity, basically going in, right? Staying in and coming out, right? And so like on the going in, um, and receiving a token. I think Wes is speaking to that part initially. That is still a gray area, which is frustrating. But, you know, in the traditional context, right, if I took, let's say, $100,000 and gave it to a private money lender in town who was going to go take that money and lend it out for mortgages, right, for people to buy houses in town, um, that's not a taxable event, right? Um, I might receive a receipt from that private money lender who says, hey, you know, uh, thanks for the hundred grand and I'm going to give you 10% interest since I'm a private money lender, I'm going to give you above market rate interest, you know? Okay, great. Still not a taxable event until I receive that 10% interest, right? Which would be in the DeFi context, what I said is in, in, in the middle, right? Or staying in, right? That would be the staying in part. Um, the thing is that in a crypto context, you do receive a different token back and IRS thinks that 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 token is property, right? And so even though it's a token that's really a receipt that's meant to represent a share of interest in a pool, it's still a different token. And again, IRS says tokens are property um, and you've disposed of one token and received another, right? In a simple context. Um, so I do think, you know, here, the other thing that kind of uh, lent that people might want to know about is that some of the discussion I've heard among practitioners is like, assessing what the marketplace is for the LP token itself, right? So early DeFi protocol, there's really no liquid marketplace for the LP tokens themselves, right? So could you take that property that you receive the LP token and go out and trade it and dispose of it for other assets, right? That might kind of weigh into IRS's thought process here as to whether, you know, that's really just a simple receipt and not a taxable event or whether it is. No, that's a dis that's disposition receipt of other property. And now you've got sort of new basis in that property. So just want to build on that a little bit. Um, the other one I wanted to jump back to was the uh, airdrops and spam coins, but I don't want to take us off track because I think we're still talking about LP stuff. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't want to butt in there and just ask. Um, so like if someone was to take kind of the more conservative route and, uh, like uh, kind of go with that idea that this is going to be a taxable event providing liquidity and also withdrawing liquidity, the people then need to kind of uh, plan and, and be aware of when they do decide to withdraw their liquidity and potentially those extra rewards. Is there anything that people should be thinking about during the, during the tax year to kind of plan ahead? Uh, there, yeah, there potentially is. Yeah. Um, I can tell you, you know, from real world case um, of, you know, long time ETH holder had very old cost basis, very low cost basis in ETH. Um, and then DeFi Spring came along and he started actively engaging in DeFi using ETH. And when we came back to look at it in the retrospective, as we do, right, sort of in tax land, you look at the year behind and everything that happened and discuss this exact issue of like, wait a second, is that a capital gain event when you've disposed ETH right into a pool and received an LP token that destroys cost basis? So does it, does it not? We discuss it with the taxpayer and he wants to take a conservative approach. He says, look, I'm all about being above board and trying to do the best thing here um, or do the most conservative thing. And sure enough, destroyed a ton of cost basis. So it can be very costly depending on costly, so to speak, depending on how old that cost basis is. Um, in terms of the tax planning aspect of like when you should think about this during the year, um, it kind of goes to the conversation of like the way out phase. The way out phase is the most difficult in DeFi. It's a total pain, right? It's pain for crypto tax calculator to keep up with the protocols and how it all works and make sure that the app can try and auto recognize these things. And it's a pain for the practitioner, us as well, because um, a lot of times what you have is a lumped in, you know, you're, get, you're getting, you know, you've put gold and silver in, right? And then what you get out is arguably some extra gold and silver, but it's all in one rock, so to speak, you know, like it's all kind of forged together. And it's like, how do you pull that apart? Because there are two 
pieces that IRS wants to see from that. They want to see what was your capital gain on the way out and what was your income portion? What was the portion that was fees, you know, from other traders on the protocol or interest paid by other borrowers on the protocol, right? That's what you get in DeFi as interest. So yeah, it's very tough. Um, in terms of the tax planning, you know, I think organizing some, um, you know, receipt or a withdrawal of those funds at the year end is like a cleanup process. It could be a good housekeeping measure for sure to be able to sort of recognize that income within the year and sort of start fresh next year, so to speak. So. Yeah. And to add on that, I think crypto tax calculator does a great job at that inventory report. So you do have the ability in those reporting settings to download that inventory report. And from a high level too, you can use the portfolio tool to be able to review your assets on hand and your unrealized gains or losses to where you can make more of a strategic decision throughout the year of, hey, when I wanna execute, sell, kind of think of any of that outgoing activity. Um, if you wanna take a very conservative approach, just default all of that outgoing activity to taxable and then kind of keep that as a perspective when you're withdrawing from liquidity pools. Yeah, before I start, before I started working at Crypto Tax Calculator, I didn't really think too much about taxes, and uh, I got stung pretty hard. Um, so now it's one of my practices before I even think about liquidity pooling or swapping or, or doing anything. Really, um, I check to see what the cost basis is and what's going to happen um, if I do that. Because yeah, I, uh, I learned the hard way one year. Um, <laughs> I just want to touch on that uh, that idea of like the rock again, like uh, you know, putting gold and silver in, and then you kind of get this uh, rock out that contains those interests, you know, rewards that you've earned in the pool. There, um, like I, I quite like that analogy, and um, I think there's something else there with crypto and liquidity pools. You know, say you put a kilo or a pound, or, or you know, I guess. I guess we're using, we're not in Australia, so we're using pounds. Um, we'll put a pound of, uh, of gold and a pound of um, silver in and you can get, you know, maybe you get three pounds of a mixture of both out, but it's no longer in the same ratio. Um, yeah. Like obviously it's in the ratio, probably in, in US dollar terms, but not in the same ratio of, you know, one asset to the other that you put in. Um, most commonly known as impermanent loss, I guess. Is there anything that people need to be aware of there or, um, you know, is that something to consider with taxes? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the common, I mean, uh, like I think Uniswap V3 and a couple of the other protocols, you know, you can limit this problem, so to speak, right? You can bound it a little bit. Um, but yeah, tip, you know, if you go sort of one ETH and a thousand USDC into a pool, right? You don't come out with one ETH and one, 1,000 USDC. That just doesn't happen. So the USDC is a lesser problem when you have one of the legs as a stable coin. Um, but when one of them is a crypto asset like ETH, which has its own you know, market price, that, um, that is a little bit problematic. So um, a lot of times, I mean, Wes can actually, I'll let Wes speak to it as sort of how we handle that. Um, you know, it can be uh, sometimes, you know, caught by the software and, and dealt with and other times it requires a manual adjustment. So, yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead and add to that. So I think from a very simplistic view, like if you're um, depositing into an LP, mm -hmm. you're receiving that LP token. I think crypto tax calculator does a really good job at allocating that cost basis to that LP token. Um, but we do see some we see difficulties on some of the allocation between LP tokens where we might see a, a redemption or, you know, you're redeeming that LP token to receive that principal back out. So um, one step we generally take, we'll, um, we'll look at that date of transaction. Uh, we might look at uh, similar LP tokens held um, retroactively and go to see first, hey, is that cost basis or is that LP that's received? Um, when it's being sent back, is that portion allocated? Like, is that the actual related LP token? If it's not, then we might go a step further and we might see um, some outgoing, let's say, for example, outgoing um, ETH LP tokens, right? When depositing in that liquidity pool. 
in that case, um, we might do some manual reconciliation in the software where we're taking that market price of that ETH, which would be that cost basis for that LP token, and we're moving it over to the LP token. So in crypto tax calculator, um, a good thing to mention is um, if you're seeing incoming or outgoing and you're seeing in the filter section, if you're seeing these warning errors, um, it, it might be the potential of some of that LP, to, um, LP activity that you're reconciling. So I'd pay special attention to those before you're generating that report, uh, you know, in U.S. perspective, generating that 8949 or your 1040 Schedule 1. Um, be mindful of the reconciliation, those warnings that you have to clear to make sure you have that accurate activity. Um, you might also see major swings on crypto tax calculator if if you negate that activity. If you're thinking, oh, I mean, I made a handful of trades in liquidity pools, but really it might not be anything of significance. Um, but it's important to capture that activity um, so then you can generate that report. Yeah, that's a really good tip. I'm going to use that myself. <laughs> um, kind of moving on, like we did touch on it a little bit um, with, you know, with DeFi, borrowing lending has come become quite a big thing. Um, do you think we could kind of quickly run through like uh, the, that whole process and, and kind of throw in a bit of a, you know, a more curly scenario where a person's, Borrowed, uh, borrowed some crypto against their collateral, but they've been liquidated. Um, would one of you guys be able to run through that scenario and on a hand, how to handle that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think there's sort of two ways that this happens in a crypto lending context, right? Just to tease them apart real quick, you've got your centralized crypto lenders, right? Where you're able to deposit an asset and maybe you can take 50% of the value of that deposited asset in something like USDC or even USD, right? As a loan against that collateral. Um, and then you've got the DeFi context uh, for doing that as well. Um, and so uh, where the automated market maker protocol, essentially the lending protocol, you know, will determine that loan to value ratio, you know, how much you can borrow. Um, but the liquidations are also potentially more automated as well. So, here, I think it's mostly a traditional analogy. We can build on it a little bit, but starting from like the baseline, um, you know, lending, uh, well, which side do you want to be on, Patrick? Do you want to be on the, the lending or the borrowing side? Borrowing side. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, mean, I can be, I can be the, the borrower, I guess. All right, yeah. So as a borrower, right, it's not a taxable event. Let's say that you've deposited, you know, sort of one Bitcoin, I guess we're above 30K today. Uh, right. And so you've got the opportunity to take a $15,000 loan, let's say, out of the protocol. Um, receipt of the proceeds from that loan is not a taxable event. You know, if you go and use that, those assets, that of course, buy crypto or do some other leverage trading or something else, right, you're going and creating new cost basis in other assets. But that activity itself, right, isn't a recognition of income and it's not a uh, recognition of a capital gain. Uh, there are scenarios where it could be. Uh, you know, sort of post facto recognition of income. Um, but, you know, for instance, defaulting on the loan, uh, you know, uh, doesn't really happen in DeFi because you have collateral that's automatically taken. But in a traditional context, that can happen, right? You default on a loan, you still got the value of, say, $50,000 of the $15,000 we talked about. Um, but uh, you don't have a, an obligation to repay the loan anymore, right? That's imputed income, essentially. It doesn't, again, happen in the DeFi context because you've got collateral um, that can be slashed or taken uh, by the protocol if you're unable to repay the loan in time or unable to sort of recapitalize the loan, right? Um, so. Cool. That makes sense. And uh, like, I think we've kind of touched on it before. If you were on that lending side of things, and you're earning interest, obviously that's going to be income. Is that right? Yeah. So if you're on the lending side, let's say you're on the other, yeah, you're on the other side of, of the protocol and you're just going to go deposit wrapped ETH for the opportunity to earn some pro rata share of the total interest that's paid into that pool by other users. Right. Um, the, uh, the deposit of that asset itself, 
now we're back to liquidity provision land, what we just talked about, right? Is that step into the pool taxable or not? But setting that aside for a second, you know, in the traditional context, no, like providing, um, providing uh, assets in that way uh, is not a taxable event. Um, the receipt of pro rata share of interest from the pool absolutely is in the traditional context. It is in the centralized lending context and it is in the DeFi context, right? It just really comes down to like the ability to track that data becomes the problem. And so, you know, in the centralized lending context, it's pretty easy. The platforms uh, either provide an API or they can provide an export that's going to show the lending activity, the interest earned and when those payouts were made, right? And what the value of those payouts were. Um, that's That makes tax compliance on your income pretty easy. Um, the DeFi context, not so much, um, you know, so to the extent, um, it depends on the protocol, I think, but right, crypto tax calculator will pick up those incoming transactions um, and they can be categorized as, you know, sort of staking reward, right, or um, or other sort of interest. And, and that will then, the, obviously the tool then categorizes them as income and gets rolled into the overall ordinary income for reporting. Okay, cool. And while, while we're still on that kind of income frame of mind, I remember you did have something to say, Noah, I think about airdrops, was it? Can you remember what? Oh yeah, I think that's an interesting case. Yeah, so some, uh, I think uh, Uzi Sashi says, yeah, oh, notes section. Oh, anyway, someone, someone asked about airdrops. Um, so one of the things we've been talking through with clients is like, what is a fair way to treat airdrops, right? So let's take the case of, uh, an airdrop that you wanted, okay, as a simple case. So let's talk about ENS, right? You went and registered an Ethereum name service. You got an address or two. You used the protocol. Uh, you know, you, you're, you know, you're uh, Patrick McGee on OpenSea with your, you know, dot, dot ETH address or whatever. Um, and then ENS does their, their airdrop, right? Pretty fairly that, hey, I've used the protocol. I received ENS token. ENS token had a relatively liquid market early and definitely has a liquid market now, right? So that's going to be income, bear market value at the time of receipt. But I think there's probably thousands more cases or like a magnitude more cases where I don't want this thing. I don't know what it is. The token name doesn't even make sense, right? And IRS, again, you know, from a baseline perspective says, no, that's income at the fair market value at the time of receipt, whether you wanted it or not. It's kind of the equivalent of like, you know, uh, some benefactor running around town and like, you know, throwing hundred dollar bills in people's mailbox. Like you didn't ask for it, but it's still a hundred dollar bill, right? Um, the problem is that most of these tokens aren't hundred dollar bills, right? They don't have a liquid market. Even if they did have a market, the price is, it's probably not a liquid market where you can get a fair market value, right? Some of them have incredible spikes early on, right? And so some of our clients have had like, we joke around with them, right? Cause we dive into the data and like the first conversation is like, well, congratulations, you know, you're a billionaire now, sort of like, you know, you were, you were just an average Joe last year and now you're a billionaire, congratulations. And so we have to work through that. And like, what's the right way to do that is I think to basically um, using the note section is great, right? Um, or this trade journal, but documenting on the side, like, hey, here's something I engaged with and that I wanted and that I could sell at the time that I received, I could have gone and disposed of it and gotten dollars and that's fairly income. And here's all the other stuff that I got that I didn't want and I want to disregard. And so of course you can ignore transactions in crypto tax calculator. That's a great way to just like basically get it out of the ledger. But I think there's another like step there of documenting sort of I'm disregarding certain income because I don't believe it's real income. I couldn't have benefited from it. I couldn't have fed my kids with it. I couldn't have sold it, you know, so that's kind of what we've been working through with clients is like, how do you do that in a, in a, in a fair and well-documented way? Yeah. And to add to that too, I think a really common use case that we see um, and just an important thing to note, like if you're holding NFTs, for example, I think Bored Ape is a really common example, you know, how ApeCoin was released and they deposited a bunch of tokens into a bunch of people's wallet addresses that, interacted with board ape or we're holding that board ape right so that ape coin that you received at that date so the date that it hit your wallet 
from a taxable perspective, you want to think of that as income at that point in time. So, you know, if you're in the U.S. and you received eight point in 2022, for example, and you're wondering what to do from a tax perspective on that, generally um, our guidance would be at that date and time. If if you want to liquidate a portion of that and hold that aside in your you know local currency to pay as taxes. So, um, you know, generally speaking, you know, U.S. side, you're paying a portion or a the threshold of what income bucket you fall into at the end of the year after all of your activities. Right. Um, but just an important thing to note a lot, a lot of cases we've seen where, you know, people are trading NFTs through the year, or maybe they're receiving a lot of these types of coins and then they haven't reserved a portion of actual fiat aside to pay for some of the returns through the year. Maybe like in 2022, the market went down and you traded, crypto further and now you're held with this crypto that's maybe worth half the asset value of what you originally deposited in you know equivalent fiat so just important things to keep in mind from a tax liability perspective and kind of ways to uh, protect yourself through the year if you're receiving airdrops you you know especially have a market price um like if you're looking on Nomics, which is no longer Nomics, but if you're looking on like a coin gecko, for example, and you're seeing a market price, you could generally assume that on that day to hit your wallet, um, you'd be recognizing the income on that airdrop. Airdrops are definitely a topical uh, thing at the moment because of, air, you know, Arbitrum, Arbitrum's recent airdrop. I know obviously that um, won't really factor into the past year's uh, tax year, but it's something that people are going to have to think about next year. Um, my entire Twitter feed is filled with airdrop threads on how to get the latest airdrop or farm the latest airdrop. So um, <laughs> will that be a few more throughout the year? Yeah, um, I think high level, like the best way to think of it is, you know, NF, NFT versus an actual market price, I guess, cryptocurrency or token for example like apecoin market price right nfts that's an interesting case because of that whole fair market value approach right how do you how do you value that do you value it based on floor level of that collection you know it could depend on the collection um but again focusing on that outgoing or actually that that sale of the nft in that use case is uh a good way to value that asset it's, it's difficult on that incoming portion. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, we've done quite a good uh, overview of a lot of the, the DeFi, most common, I guess, DeFi transactions. I, I do have a, a kind of uh, more curly situation that I put myself in, um, falling down the rabbit hole, very far <laughs> down, uh, into some on-chain options trading. Um, over in Australia, we have... Uh, the likes of like Dopex and Lira available. I, I know in the US, those aren't available. Um, something like Premium might be a better example. Um, I was wondering if we could run through, you know, just briefly kind of uh, what people need to think about with options, like, you know, buying an options contract um, and maybe even writing an options contract. Um, is there different things need to, people need to think about with those two, two different avenues? Yeah, let's do it. Options, I agree, especially DeFi options. Uh, pretty bleeding edge, I would say. You know, like a, when I look at a you know, few of these protocols, we're talking about sort of pretty low volume still, but very interesting area. Like from a, a tax uh, accounting crypto nerd perspective, I think it's pretty fascinating to think about how these marketplaces could grow. You know, I mean, options, the way I think of them are it's, you know, insurance contracts really, you know, um, at the end of the day, or that's at least how professional investors have used them year for years. Um, I'm not sure how you use them, Patrick, or what benefit they are to you, but, uh, but yeah, generally I think of them right as insurance contracts and doing that anything on chain in an automated, fair, transparent, orderly, you know, uh, way is pretty cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, maybe just to kind of like, make sure we are talking in clear terms for folks, you know, just kind of set the baseline, right? So um, 
I think the way in basically, if you think about buying an options contract and that, that could be, you know, that could be a call uh, market goes up or it could be a put market goes down, you know, sort of insurance case, you know, let's say you're buying that with crypto. Traditionally you buy those instruments, those financial instruments or contracts with U S dollars or a local currency, right. On a centralized marketplace in a DeFi context, obviously you're starting with crypto. Um, some of the protocols I think are ETH others, you know, like I think DopeX is with CRV, you kind of start, right. So interesting, but essentially you're going to go buy a contract you're disposing of ETH property in order to obtain a financial instrument or a contract, right? So that right there, um, I think is arguably a taxable event, you know, subject to a capital gain, right? You're going to recognize a capital gain or loss on the disposition of that ETH or CRV in order to buy the contract, um, you know, and then there's sort of options from there, right? Like you, you can, you can buy a contract, you can sell a contract, you can execute a contract or you can let it expire. Right. I guess it's sort of four buckets of things you can do. Um, and you know, if you're, it like becomes a matrix, right? There's like four here and four here. It's like, there's so many options of, and then, you know, what the implication is, what the tax implication is, but like, generally speaking, you still kind of have these two levers. You've got income, and you've got capital gain, right? So I've bought, you know, a call option and um, I exercise it, right? Well, I've spent value to buy the contract, right? And I, that may be a, a capital gain again for me event where I bought that contract on chain. Um, and then let's say I exercise that call option and purchase. Well, now I'm, you know, probably have another capital gain event potentially as well, or at least I'm setting new cost basis for the options that I've exercised the call on. You know, if you let that option expire, for instance, you say, okay, didn't didn't work, money down the drain, insurance contract money down the drain, or whatever premiums paid, but at least I didn't have a disaster or whatever. Um, then you're still you spent that value. So that capital gain event is probably still there. On the other side of the transaction, you know, that's that's income. In in traditional sort of uh, traditional options tax, you know, generally speaking, you know, that uh, receipt of a premium for the purchase of that contract or the sale of that contract is going to be income, but it's not income until that contract is exercised or it's expired. Right. And, and the, uh, the seller of the contract can actually receive that premium. So it's a, it's a tangled mess. Um, that's, it's already like kind of a mind twisting thing with options, you know, generally speaking, and then you put it in a DeFi context. And really what you get is the, the sort of repeat complexities of like, okay, now how do I track this? Like, how does the software track it? Do I need to manually adjust it? Like that kind of stuff. So I'm not so sure you, if that helps. But. Uh, yeah. Well, basically you're telling me I have a, a tax nightmare on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's my own yeah. <laughs> but, but once you guys, once you and, and you guys solve it, the collective, you guys solve it, then it'll help other people. So. Yeah, definitely working on it. I need it for myself. <laughs> now, I know we said we're taking a deep dive on DeFi taxes today, but we have really gone down the rabbit hole. Um, we've only got about seven, eight minutes left on the call today. So shall we get to some crowd questions? We've had heaps coming in. All right. So um, this one's from Cody Stanton. And thanks to everyone that has been submitting your questions. Really appreciate it. Um, you're welcome to still add them to the chat. Um, from Cody. Cody says, I bought crypto on FTX US and transferred them out, but I no longer have access to the information of how much crypto I bought and when. How should I report this cost basis? Excellent question. Yeah. That's, yep, that's a tough one. Um, if you've got literally no records, um, but you do have a record of your deposit into FTX US or any exchange where you don't have records, right? This is actually a common historical problem with even Binance.com, right? Sort of a limitation on, on data that's exportable. Um, so any exchange, uh, if you've got a way, if you've got value in and you know, it sounds like you were able to pull assets out, um, hopefully 100% of them, but if you're able to pull assets out, then you've kind of got you know what you went in with and you know what you went out with. And that's kind of what you'd call like a mark to market approach, essentially, right? I put a dollar in, I was able to withdraw $10. It sounds like you might've done one thing or 10 or a hundred things in between, 
but you basically got a $9 capital gain at the end of the day, right? So that's one way to look at it. Um, yeah, I think if you're trying to trying to comply, that's probably the best way to look at it. But from a data perspective, that doesn't make it easy in the tools either, right? Because um, you might have had multiple assets, right? And so we're not really talking about you know one dollar in and ten dollars out. We're talking about you know five, ten, twenty tokens in, right? Or maybe one token in or dollars in, and then ten, twenty tokens coming out. And so then how do you allocate that cost basis? So it's, it's definitely, definitely tricky, definitely a problem when data is not available. Mm. Tricky indeed. Thanks, Noah. And thank you, Cody, for the question. Now we did have, we've had this question asked by um, several users on the comments and also in our emails. Um, you can always send us an wow. email to submit your questions as well. This one comes from Manuel and Steve as well. Uh, the question is, when would you recognize the rewards that are in a shared pool that you have to hit redeem in order to receive it to your wallet? Would it be when it was available or when it hit your wallet? That is a, another great question. Um, that's also a um, nuance in tax world and how that's currently treated. Um, so I think just to break that apart for the rest of the audience, uh, really the question is, what's the recognizable event for a market price? Is it that date that you have available to claim this activity? Or is it the date that you're actually redeeming that activity? So that's, that's a great point. So, I mean, from a high level, um, the date available to be claimed would be more defendable from an IRS uh, tax perspective than the date actually being claimed. I know it's easier said um, in practice than actually done in execution in terms of going into these transactions. You know, well, if I have one transaction hash that I'm redeeming these rewards, right, and it's hitting crypto tax calculator at that market price, well, I might be accumulating these rewards on a daily basis, right? or maybe on a monthly basis. So um, I would say it depends. Um, I would focus the on, I guess, the percentage it affects your total activity and how much manual effort you want to put into that type of activity. So I guess the quote unquote appropriate method, if you have uh, data available on available to be claimed, let's say, for example, you, um, you have one asset that's available to be claimed January 1st. Um, it's accruing interest daily, but you don't redeem that until January 30th, for example. Um, one potential approach would be taking um, maybe an average market price per day to be able to take the actual market price on date of redemption to be able to find, um, you know, I guess the general market price on when that's being deemed. But this is where it's very nuanced and, uh, and, and it gets com complex on, you know, what are you trying to redeem? Does it have a market price um, at the date on a previous date? Yeah, I know it, it means on-chain fees, but trying to align your redemptions with the time that they're available in some respect is actually a good idea. Just remember that IRS, if they're, you know, thinking about this question, they might say, well, if you're a W-2 income employee in the U.S. and you get paid by a, you know, sort of automatic ACH deposit to your bank account, IRS doesn't care when you went and withdrew the money from the bank, right? You got paid a certain amount per per two weeks or per month, and that was your income for the year. If you chose to not withdraw any money from your bank account and then went next year, you know, into January and withdrew all the money and said, okay, now only now I have income, that's kind of you know, obviously it would be an absurd argument to make uh, to IRS. So the, this kind of similar here. Um, it's just that the, the crypto complexities come into play of like, well, wait, it wasn't even available to redeem. I've accrued it on this day, but I couldn't even I couldn't even withdraw it. Right. So and there might be those market price changes in between. So. Yes, that would be a ridiculous argument and not one that I think that you would win if that was one you were trying to make. Thank That's you, right. Noah, and thanks for the question. Now, we are about to hit the hour. Could I be greedy and ask two more questions of you guys? Let's do it. All right. 
Thank you. Um, we've just had so many come in. It's been really great seeing all the comments coming in. So um, we had an email, an, a listener come in through email asking about rebase tokens. Could you provide a quick overview on how rebase tokens are taxed, please? No, I don't want to. I don't want to think about rebase tokens. <laughs> Too much of a headache? Uh, yeah, definitely. A big headache. I don't know if Wes wants to take a stab at it, but um, it's it's candidly one of the more complex, sticky issues. There's not a good traditional analogy. There's definitely no guidance, and it's difficulty. It's difficult from a data and reconciliation perspective as well, right? I mean, it, it's just a problematic thing. Yeah, I think even in terms of rebase as a definition, right? It's a very elastic type of currency. So I think fundamentally speaking, I mean, you could think of, we could go back to our earlier discussions, right? Of that incoming outgoing. I think you could think of it from a high level. Anytime you're uh, conservatively executing a trade, swapping a currency, anything of that nature, conservatively speaking, I would keep in your mind, that's most likely a taxable event. Yeah, and that's changes right. in between, maybe you can make the unrealized gain argument or unrealized loss argument, right? If it's, but it, it's very protocol or very token specific, very individual case specific, I would say as well. And and, and just a data problem, so. <laughs> Sorry to give you such a curly question at the end. It's Hopefully our very last question. Is, yeah. <laughs> our very last question we'll take from um, Steve. Thank you, Steve, for your questions. Um, Steve wants to know, uh, for a decentralized app with its own alternate cur currency for interest earning deposits, if he deposits one ETH and he gets one RETH in my wallet, RETH is not tradable on any other um, centralized exchanges or decentralized exchanges, are these deposits and withdrawals taxable events? Yep, that's a Great tough question. one, right? So, Yep, so what you're talking about, you know, again, from what we believe IRS would be likely to say is, okay, our ETH is property. Uh, you know, our ETH was received at a specific point in time that's identifiable. And there was a, was there a fair market value? I think is the question here, right? For that asset. Um, and so, you know, I don't know about the specific protocol. I have to probably look into that more deeply, but um, if there's no outside marketplace, that's one thing, but is there a market for it on the specific platform or protocol? It sounds like there probably is. They could derive a price for, you know, for instance, what you can take our ETH for and, um, you know, trade that for ETH on that platform. Um, or ETH if you want to buy more our ETH, for instance. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's exactly how that protocol works, but you can usually derive a price from sort of acquisition price plus fees, which is actually something we didn't say in the past, right? But your basis in these crypto to crypto trades is fairly including the acquisition costs, which are, you know, gas fees essentially, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of the, those cases where, you know, you could maybe try and articulate an argument to say that it's not income or that it's not a trade that's taxable. Um, but then why are you doing it to begin with is what IRS would probably say, right? Well, you are receiving some benefit or value from this, right? Are you not? Right. And so, uh, I hate to be the, you know, the bummer, uh, sort of the, the wet blanket on that one, but, um, that's, <laughs> That's how I would break that one down. Awesome. Thank you for the answer. Um, well, we have gone a couple of minutes over. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, and thanks, everyone, for watching for your questions. Noah and Wesley, um, we did have so many questions, so we will try and get to either another video or an email. Um, keep an eye out. Subscribe to our emails if you are watching and want uh, answers for the questions that we couldn't get to today. But Noah and Wesley, if our audience wants to find out more about you guys and the good work you guys are doing, where should they go? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share. Um, so you can find us at uh, thenetworkfirm.com. We try and make it easy for people to get in contact with us there. There's actually a book now button. You can kind of select a service that you're in interested in. You know, this would be industry specialized services is sort of what we do for tax basis tracking and advisory support. And yeah, so you can literally book a meeting with us if you want. Uh, send us an email, um, you know, through the website, hit us up on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, whatever you want. But if you, you know, want to talk face to face, uh, 
the website's probably the best avenue. Awesome. Uh, we have a friendly dog clearly interested in DeFi taxes as well. And you may have noticed my cat joined us during the call, also inter She's interested hungry. in DeFi taxes. So thank you both for uh, a very engaging conversation. And uh, for everyone watching at home, if you are looking for a crypto tax solution, cryptotaxcalculator.io, um, we're there for you. And I have exciting news. We actually have a bonus session. So um, tomorrow, same time, same place, we'll be having another session uh, live so you can answer, ask and we'll get your questions answered then as well. Tomorrow we'll be discussing uh, DAOs and governance tokens, what the tax implications of holding, voting and earning are. And we'll be joined by Andrew Gordon from Gordon's Law, Gordon Law. And he's a crypto tax attorney, so another expert to pick the brain of. Thank you again, Noah, Wesley and Patrick. Have a, have a lovely evening and uh, yeah, really appreciate you joining us. It's been fun. Thanks, guys. Great chatting. Thank you. Bye. Bye.